thanks uh, thanks for uh, inviting me here to this what I think is a very interesting and uh, potentially important uh, important workshop so uh, I think we all agree that what I mean if you think about what the final theory for the brain should look like which is quite a far away from that but I mean we need to integrate and bridge different levels of detail all the way from molecules up to behavior and I think the people in this room also agree that this knowledge has to be stored in mathematical models somehow and and this mathematical model cannot just be uh, like a, a, a large collection of molecules put into a large simulator you have to do more than that that you have to I mean, if you ask the question what should the final mathematical theory for the brain look like it must involve some kind of multi-scale approach where you describe the system at, at the, with a set of the interconnected models which together span the interesting temporal and spatial scales so um, we, we have worked on this uh, in our group in particular in the, on the focus on, on the, with the with our, our, our main interest has been on early sensory processing in the visual system and the somatosensory system and I've, I've identified a few key challenges which we have met which I think is quite general for this multi-scale approach in, in biology. So one thing is that we, we need to develop this what they call interconnected set of models at different levels of, of, of uh, at different levels of biological detail what can we call multi-granular modeler modeling bridging together spatial and temporal scales and then you also make to sort of modeling what you can measure you also need to make connections from what you model to things you can measure and this is something which I think has been underemphasized in computational neuroscience altogether people have been measure modeling spikes and not so much more else but these are difficult to measure at least for many neurons and then a key headache modeling when you don't know all the numbers meaning we don't know the parameters this I, I use the semiconductor physics that there we had four parameters I mean it's like electron mass Planck's constant and, 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 and two more and they were known to ten digits and here we don't know really much about the numbers at all and this is sort of what I call like inher inherited sin we don't really talk about this as much as we should because we don't really know how to deal with it so we sort of prefer to keep it uh, or we don't address it as often as we should but this is something we have to do and then of course there's a question if you have then these different candidate models eventually you would like to use the models to find out what is the best model what is the model that best explains this brain part or whatever this thing and, and then you need to compare models with experiments and how do you do that and that's not so easy particularly when you sort of don't know all the numbers and it's also make not always so easy to make the connection between the models and what you measure and then the fifth point is what I call modeling tools and uh, uh, hygiene uh, meaning that you actually do I mean do reproducible computational science so I'll go through go through these uh, these uh, elements and with the basis of of like I mean in the basis of uh, but starting with work that we have done in our group that is a starting point so two main model systems which we have focused on in one in our group one is the the, the, the whisker cortex in uh, in uh, the rat barrel cortex as you know that each or some of you know that each the rat has this fantastic whisker system uh, where each whisker has a principal piece or a re reserved um, place in, in the cortex which makes this both a like, conceptually and, and sort of technically uh, not easy but less complicated s system to study Marcel is going to talk a lot about about this later and then we also have looked at uh, early visual system in mammals and in particular um, the, the LGN and, uh, and the, the, the processing from thalamus and the thalamocortical loop and so on but they are not really the main as I said the main focus point of this talk it's more mainly that this is where we got the examples from and this talk and our work is it goes from the neuron level and up so all these things which are below the neurons how I mean the multi-scale things going on below there is not something that I'm going to address even though there are other talks in this meeting which which will address that so first multi-granular modeling bridging spatial and temporal scales the first thing we need to do, need to do is or we need different representations of a neuron and I think in if like people have uh, if you look at their model the, the, the modeling approaches people have had to neurons I think they could I mean one way to, to, to group them organize them is that you have the, at level one this detailed multi-compartmental neuron level two simplified spiking neurons and level three firing rate 
uh, firing rate models. And of course these different connections of these different levels of modeling must be connected. Just like uh, for those of you who study physics, remember from that if you want to describe a gas of molecules, then you can either do it in a, at the level of individual molecules and with Newton's law, and velocities and positions and so on, or you can do it at the level of thermodynamics, pressure, volume and so on. And these, I mean, these, these are perfectly sort of a valid descriptions at the different levels, in some sense, of, of the system. But they may all, must also be interconnected. So it cannot be sort of like an arbitrary, like, and, and, and Boltzmann show, and Boltzmann Moxel showed uh, 150 years ago how these were connected. This is how statistical physics came about. And it must be the same thing with neurons, that these different levels of description of neurons must be systematically connected. And uh, our group, we have done quite a bit of work, or like some work, on the connection between this, this simplified spiking models, like integrated fire type models, and the firing rate models, both in the case, I mean, for different situations. One, in the case we have really strong synapses, so you don't have strong inputs, that's for the retina geniculate connection, but also in these uh, recurrent networks. And this is work that is just, just coming out. It's, it's uh, I mean, this, this, there's been less work, lots of people have done work on this connect, connecting level two and level three. It's been less work from level one to level two. And one reason is that there's very few, like, ground truth or like gold standard multi-compartmental models which you can trust, which you would, would like to, if you want to sort of to, to make an approximation to something, you would like to have a solid starting point, something which is worth approximating. But there's really not that many multi-compartmental models out there which you can sort of trust to the extent that you would really would go out of your way to try to approximate them to, to into the simpler models. And, of course, at the level of the barrel column, this three-level approach would be that you have the level, different levels description of, um, of, uh, of the same cortical uh, circuit, which has about, like, I don't know, 10,000, 10, 20,000 uh, neurons. And, uh, of course, the, the, the Blue Brain project is then at, um, obviously, at level one, really detailed uh, models, but you also need detailed neural models, but you also need the same kind of model, you need to represent the same system at these different more coarser, coarser uh, levels, but these must be interconnected. And then there's another thing that we worked on, which also Eric addressed, this thing that most of computational neuroscience has been on synaptic integration, been on the millisecond time scale or 10 or 100 millisecond time scale. How does a single neuron get input and produce new spikes? And then typically the salient variable is the membrane potential, and maybe you model the calcium and concentration because that's a single molecule. But all these other, the main players, sodium, potassium, and chloride, are not modeled at all. You assume this invisible janitor that takes care of this. And, and this is sometimes uh, okay, but if you want to model things at longer time scales, for example, at second time scales, diffusion starts getting important and you have to keep track of, of all these ions. There are processes where maybe like potassium is funneled out like the spatial buffering, if you want to include that, you need to take care of the concentrations. And if you model, I mean, ion pumps and so on, that must be included. And so in order to make the connection to, to the model these processes at longer time scales, we need actually a, a new schemes that takes this thing into account. And uh, we have done some modeling of, of, uh, of this, uh, uh, like uh, interaction between neurons and, and astrocytes, where these time scales comes into play. And when you try to ex actually get a spatial, like, um, a spatial component into that, meaning that like some parts of the astrocyte are closer to high firing than others, then we ran into trouble with existing schemes. So we had to actually develop a new scheme to make sure that things stay electroneutral and don't get unstable and so on. So this is something that we are actually presenting at this. Uh, as a uh, poster at this upcoming neuroinformatics meeting in in <laughs> in uh, Munich. So meaning that the, the, the basic physics has not really, the modeling schemes have not been really developed. It's not only the tools have not been developed, we don't really know uh, the basic, the mesoscopic physics are efficient schemes for that. So that's the first part. The second part is modeling what you can measure. So, I mean, uh, from a test model should be able to make predictions for all measurement modalities. I mean, we have, I mean, not only electrical, but also optical uh, and, uh, and, and the, the kind of, uh, kind of available um, 
uh, I mean, measurement models that we have. The, the reason that we got into this is that we have a long-term collaboration with uh, Anna DeVore and Anders Dale, now at UC San Diego, where they did this laminar electrode recordings from the rat <laughs> paracortex. And then if you flick a whisker and measure the extracellular potential as a function of, uh, of, um, of depth, it, it's there any pointer that works on this screen? Mine doesn't, it works outside, but not on the, on the screen, which is somewhat inconvenient. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so if we if you flick the whisker and you measure the electrical potential, I mean after you flick the whisker across the depth, you see something in the low frequencies and you see something in the high frequencies, and low frequencies presumably reflects mainly synaptic the processing of synaptic inputs, and the high frequencies the, the firing. But this has this, this is all. Uh, Something that's very, uh, the interpretation of this just by hand or just by looking at this is not trivial. And I think that's one of the reasons why these, uh, the people have focused on single neuron properties because they are at least, it's limited, but you know what you measure. So we, but the good thing about this is that we know the basic measurement physics. We know, we know the forward solution. If you have, say, an activity in, a, if the only thing that happens in your, piece of the brain is that they have one orange neuron receiving an excitatory input up at the red triangle there. Then what you will get, you will get the, when there's an uh, excitatory or uh, uh, impinging uh, synaptic input, you get the current sink and you get the current source uh, which uh, well, leaves all over, leaves from all over the neuron. But if you for simplicity just for this, just for now assume that all leads through the soma this, from uh, the, the cable, uh, cable equation, it follows that this current source must have the same but opposite sign as the current sink. And if you know these current sources and sinks, then you know the positions of these sinks and sources, you can calculate the, the extracellular potential model at the, uh, at measured at the electrode. And this, uh, and this is quite well established based on volume conduction theory and, and so on. And <coughs> but of course, the, the problem with this is that, well, the good thing is, the problem is that you, when you measure something in the brain, you measure from many sources. And uh, so it's not so easy to disentangle. The good thing, though, is that this is linear. So it applies for a uh, multi-compartmental model. You just have to sort of keep track of all transmembrane currents in all compartments. And it also applies to, to neuronal populations. So we have done a quite a bit of work on investigating or, or to doing this kind of forward modeling scheme to understand make the connection between neural activity, like spiking, and what you measure on the outside, or synaptic input, and what you measure on the outside. So this is an example of, the, of a calculated local field potential. Now, not a calculated local field potential, this is a calculated extracellular signature of a spike at various positions. So if you put your electrode there in this, uh, you see there were the red electrode points, uh, you, you measure this kind of uh, sharp negativity and a, a slow positivity, which is typically what you measure if you have an electrode close to a, uh, close to a neuron. So meaning that this is a quite, I would say, it's, it's not, it still needs more validation, but uh, it's still a quite well-established scheme. So one thing that we use this for, and this is a little bit of a side comment, why, what we can use these multi-scale models for. It's not only to sort of make, I mean, one thing is to make predictions uh, from a network in a, more of a network model and compare with experiments, but it can also be used to test widely used data analysis methods. And one key problem that people really use, has, has use a lot, or uh, which is widely used and is, is very problematic, is this question of spike sorting. If you put down an electrode in the brain, you pick up spikes at the high frequencies, you pick up spikes from neighboring neurons. But what would you like to know is what neuron fired when? Like individual spikes, because uh, the individual spikes of individual neurons. Because that is often is, it contains important information about how correlated the populations are and so on. So this is like this spike sorting is now an important uh, technical thing, analysis technique that people use. And it's very uh, time consuming and it's unreliable. It's the result depends on who is doing the experiments and what lab is involved. Uh, so everybody's in, interested in, in this automated spike sorting algorithms. So, but how do we test this? Well, one, if you want to test things reliably, you would like to have some ground truth data. Data where you know what the true result is, because then you really have control over your algorithm. So this is something that we have are generating with this this forward modeling scheme. This is an example of a, a, a tetrode. This is like an electrode or multi-electrode with the four contacts. 
uh, shown these cities uh, red and uh, red and blue and green and uh, and yellow and this uh, these triangles there are are uh, neurons pyramidal neurons which are spiking and then we can uh, impose spiking as we want in our model world and then calculate this extracellular potential that is recorded at these tetrodes, like mimicking, making a sort of like a virtual experiment. And then we can give this, essentially these tetrode, these tetrode recordings to the spike shorting algorithms that start well now you tell us the spikes and then we can test afterwards. So this is an open-ended approach. We can make this as, as because if, if there's a lot of correlation, bursting and things like the cha spike shape varies from spike to spike and so on. There's all kind of complication that you see in real life. But this is an open-ended approach. We can add as much of this as we want and make like a whole set of, of test, uh, well, test data. So there's a collaborative effort on the development and validation of these uh, automatic spike sorting algorithms. And the German node is now hosting this, this website where, where people with algorithms should meet people with data. And this is uh, um, well up and running, uh, hopefully in June. And, but this, of course, this problem of data validation and uh, validation analysis methods is not only for, for uh, sp uh, spike sorting algorithms. It's also, it also applies to all kinds of other analysis methods or it, the approach, at least, we should try to, to validate or test these, these analysis methods as, as much as we can. So we're going to have an INCF workshop, like similar in format to this, in three weeks' time here in Stockholm, where we're going, this is going to be the the focus where you not only talk about spike sorting but also analysis of LFP and also this spike estimation from two photon calcium imaging how to go from calcium bumps measured from neurons to, to, uh, to spikes okay and then we also done some work on the uh, on the local field potential investigating how that varies with uh, synaptic position uh, and so on and for example this is what uh, one hertz uh, uh, a, neuro a true neuronal dipole looks like. This is people who are doing EEG analysis or MEG analysis. They s try to make all these mesoscopic dipole and, and estimate them. And they, I think it's coming back there. So, uh, and this is what this, this, or these neuronal dipoles really, I'm saying so, what they really look like. So based on this, and, and one thing we see is that when you do, when you have a 100 hertz dipole, it's not just the same thing 100 times faster. It's completely different, meaning that, and this has been neglected in typical in analysis of LFP or EEG data uh, so far. I mean, some people have gotten sort of wrong, sort of made wrong interpretations simply because they haven't done the measurement physics or taken into account the, the measurement physics properly. And this is another study we did where we uh, investigated how local the local field potential really is. So if you, so the outcome of this was that if you put down an electrode in the cortical tissue, and the neurons are uncorrelated, you typically pick up the signals from, from neurons 0.2 millimeters or less away. If it's correlated, then it in increases. One interesting thing, if you look at this, this multi-level scheme, which you talk about, and, and this multimodal modeling, what you can measure, typically the connection to the, from the models to what you can measure happens at these levels of reconstructed neurons. A point neuron doesn't have an LFP. And so typically, if you're in this multi-level scheme, you would need to make the connection be with, between your models and what you can measure at, at level one. It doesn't mean that you should get the dynamics necessarily right at level one. Maybe it's better to do that with integrating fire neurons. But you then you need some kind of hybrid scheme to make these predictions, and that's also something that we, that we are working on. And we're going to have a workshop on this, uh, actually modeling what you can measure. Uh, I think Christoph Koch and Jason Kerr is coming to this. It's like one of the workshops at the uh, Neuroinformatics Congress in Munich in, in September. I think that can be nice. Okay, and then the third, uh, that was like two points. The third point is modeling when you don't know all the numbers. And this is an example from our own lab. We did this made this multi-compartmental model of an LGN interneuron. And interneurons in LGN are these like, quite mysterious creatures because they not only have axonal output, they also have these dendrodendritic interactions. So anyway, so we wanted to have, because we want to understand the circuit behavior, so we needed a good, good interneuron models. So we did, I think, what, sort of what is quite common when you make these multi-compartmental neuron models. You do some experiments, or we didn't do some other experiments, but there were 
Hegelund in Oslo did this uh, patch clamp recordings from interneurons in ejected currents in the soma and got out these traces, so on. And then we had like uh, two examples or like two, two interneurons, uh, like uh, experiments, that we then tried to make a model for. And then uh, Gerd Holness did, a, I mean, in, found the right, uh, he's a postdoc in our group, found sort of like the, the right conductances and then, and then found essentially a set, to, at the end, a set of conductances, not only, I mean, the values of the conductance densities and, and different parameters that gave quite good fit to the, to the data. So this is a quite, a, quite a, and of course now we hope that this represents, uh, this represents sort of like two uh, interneurons, which we can then and use these models maybe for, uh, for other purposes in circuits and so on. But this is really uh, unsatisfactory, right? This is what everybody does, and then you can do a little bit of sensitivity analysis and see how much you have to change things in order to... But this is, and these and this conductance values are maybe taken, taken from even different species and certainly different mammals. And so, so it's really unclear what we have learned from this. And, and this is not, I mean, we are not worse than others, but uh, this is sort of like the standard kind of modeling we do with, with neurons. And it's, it's rather dramatic situation. I think this is the most kind of, this is the most, I mean, the tip, the, the type, uh, mo most commonly done modeling, right? Multi-compartmental modeling of single neurons. And we're very on very shaky grounds, but we get it published. So then somehow sort of like it solves sort of like the, the sociological issues. Uh, <laughs> but, but still it's something deeply worrying about this. And this is something we have to have to address. And uh, it's even more problematic, of course, for cortical network models. This is a paper that just came out from uh, uh, from Simon Schultz and uh, well, it's from uh, from Imperial, and it's it's a nice paper. But I mean, this is uh, for cortical network models, and and the five first tables were on the parameters. So and of course, it's uh, so this is what it has to be, right? And it's, so it's it's a good paper in the sense that they really describe what they've done, so we can build on it. But it's really unclear what it really means. So uh, and then of course, then it's a question if you have then this different these uh, candidate models. How do you, f how, do you comp how do you find out what is, what is closest to reality? Right? That's what you typically want to do with the models. You want to identify use them to make predictions and find out who is closest to reality. <coughs> so then, after we have then, if you have these candidate models and we calculate all these these things that you can calculate, I mean, spark rates, multi-unit activity, LFP, maybe voltage-sensitive dye imaging, if you have that, or calcium imaging, and so on. And then you want to find the most, you don't want to do this for many models, and then you want to find the most probable model given all available data. So how do you do that? I mean, that's, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, there are, it's, it's, it's not easy at all. I mean, they, you can say, you can say base, but I mean, it's not easy to make a practical Bayesian scheme as far as I've seen for, for this, in these multimodal situations and, and so on. And, and you can do this, something about that, that the models with fewer parameters are more convincing than the models with many parameters, but it's, I don't know. So we had an example, where, for example, where we want to do, we met this, we wanted to extract a, a firing rate model at, uh, for the, the processing of, um, of, the, of, of, of whisker input to this column, where we used this, the same kind of data that we saw earlier, but also had a sharp electrode in the, in the thalamus, pointing in uh, at the, the thalamus, projecting to this, uh, <coughs> projecting to this, I, I'm my own watch here also. So projecting to the, to the laminar electrode, now projecting to the principal column. So then the kind of data you get out is this, and from this we can actually get out, uh, oh sorry, we can get out population firing rates. That's the first step. We use the measurement physics to get out the population firing rates for these populations with uh, populations in different layers in the, in the cortex. And then the next thing is from these population firing rates we can ask the question, well what model explains this population firing rate, the ex extracted or observed population firing rates best. So these were like the estimated population firing rates. So for so far, Soviets, uh, until now, it's only data analysis. So we have like population firing rates from the thalamus and these different layers. And then we, want to, we wanted to make this like general model for the transition from thalamus to layer four with some feed forward terms, recurrent terms, and so on. And then we end up with two it turns out that the, the model is not, the data is not rich enough to really to have too many parameters in there. It's sort of, it's, it's, you, you cannot find the minimum. So then you start looking at reduced 
uh, reduced versions of it. One where you only look into account, take into account the recurrent, mm -hmm. saying that the recurrent uh, interaction, actually the slow, slow time scale recurrent interaction, is, is key thing. And the other thing is, uh, the other model assumes that it's a feed forward thing. And then you do this, you fit this to these different models, no, fit these different models to the data. And then you, you see and you, and you see that actually the recurrent model fits the data slightly better in terms of like numerical error. But then it, it's really difficult to really to make a statement, I think. What is really the best of these two models? I mean, there are things you can do. You can sort of do, they do look at the, uh, I mean, there are, there are certain things you can do and there are some Akaiki criteria and so on. But it's really this question, who of the candidate models are best? And this is something which we also need to sort of like systematically address. If you know the, if you have models and make these experimental predictions, and then we want to make something who of these models are best or how much better, or what is the best we can say about, about the world based on this, this modeling experience. So last thing, modeling tools and hygiene. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, ob obviously we need to, to, uh, to develop I mean, effective, reliable, and easy to use simulation analysis tools. And we've done a few. We made this LFPI for simulation of extracellular potentials. And, and, and we're also involved in, Hans Eckhart Plesser in our group is involved in, in NEST. And we also developed some, uh, some ICSD tools, uh, also with Klaus Petersen, also Shimon, who's sitting, uh, sitting here. So I think uh, what we would like at the end of the day is to be able to, to have like a test model put up, maybe like formulating it with spiking networks or what have you, and then like quite easily on your computer get out this different prediction for different measurement modalities. <coughs> and then there are many initiatives like this, many, uh, many of you in the room are involved in this. You should get the logo, Upi. I was trying to find Moose, but there was no Moose logo. I couldn't find it. So it's not a website? I couldn't find it. So. Uh, Anyway, so logos are important if you want to sort of show off your... No. It resonates well with Sweden. What? It resonates well with Sweden. Though. Really? Okay, so I couldn't, sorry. So then, so you should have like an open access logo then. <laughs> oh, sorry. So anyway, but there's also this other thing, modeling, what I call modeling hygiene, how to make computational neuroscience reproducible. So they have like uh, Alan Uli and uh, Mark Oliver Gewaltig and Hans-Eckert Plesser in our, our group. Mark Oliver, of course, now is at, at the in Lausanne, had this paper about how to make this, actually this, how to communicate models and how to make them reproducible. For example, by making these, uh, yeah, like special like, uh, like declarations of what the model uh, contains in a standardized way and, and so on. So these are also things that needs to be addressed. So finally, just to summarize these key, key, key challenges. And I think if you take up the, the take up the, the challenge from Eric. I think it's, it's when it comes to these two points, modeling what you can measure uh, and, and or particularly maybe modeling when you don't know all the numbers and selection of best model when comparing with experiments, it's not a question of tools really. It's more a question about understanding what to do. So I think, in, I think one thing we could do in our multi-scale program is to have some workshops on this. I, I've talked to this about with several people. And everybody who's, who's, who's a serious modeler worries about these things. So I think it would actually have resonance, uh, I mean, have be of interest to many people in the, in the community if we organize such, uh, uh, such uh, workshops, workshops. So, okay, and then this, this is the acknowledgements from the people who have contributed to this, this work at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, which is just uh, in the suburb of Oslo, 30 kilometers south of Oslo, and then these other, other places. So, thank you.